Good morning, everybody. And uh, actually, I'm saying good morning because I'm based in New York and this is morning, but I realize it must be afternoon for most of you. Um, and welcome to the webinar on uh, supporting churches in helping to end violence against children. Um, we are very grateful for your interest and your time. So um, this, as, as it, you might know, this uh, um, webinar is part of a series of webinars that uh, uh, the World Council of Churches is organizing together with UNICEF, um, aiming at uh, supporting churches who expressed um, a particular interest in one of the areas of the church's commitments to children. Uh, and in particular, today we're exploring the issue of violence against children. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give you a very quick um, introduction on what we mean when we speak about violence against children. Um, so the data uh, tell, tells us that most of the violence against children happens um, in, places, in the places where they spend the most time and they uh, should feel safer. That is at home, in school and in their communities. And it also tells us that it happens most of the times at the hands of those that um, they spend most of the time with, they interact on a daily basis and uh, of, of whom, they, whom they should trust the most, uh, uh, close people. That's why we say that often for children violence wears a familiar face. Um, a little bit of uh, data that I can give you about violence at home is that three quarters of children uh, between two and four years old are subject, of, uh, are subject to violent discipline on a daily basis uh, by their parents or caregivers. And we also know that um, wealth is not a factor, uh, is not a determining factor because violence is as prevalent in wealthy uh, households that it is in poorer ho households. Um, about the brain development, uh, we have long known that um, proper nutrition and the stimulation are key to the development of the brain in the first two years of uh, life of a child. But um, what we didn't know is uh, how much uh, protection from violence is also a key factor in the sense that expose, exposure to um, traumatic uh, experiences um, can uh, permanently alter the structure and the function of, of a child's brain. Um, about sexual abuse, we know that nine out of 10, so almost all the adolescent girls who report um, having had forced sex, they say that happened, that happened for the first time at the hands of someone close to them, someone very well known to them. Um, so these are all very pretty disturbing um, uh, data that, that we do have. And uh, what UNICEF does to um, try to tackle this, uh, of course, uh, very complex um, problem is um, acting at a, a different levels. So we assist um, in the government in the development and in implementation of uh, legal and policy frameworks. Uh, we try to provide technical support to the justice, the social welfare, the health and the education system. Um, we support, uh, at the same time, we try to support communities and families and parents directly. And of course, um, uh, trying to shift uh, social norms. And uh, in particular for these two, the last two um, issues that I mentioned are, I think, the ones where uh, religious communities can be um, really vital. Um, so what, what can religious actors do to uh, end violence against children? Well, first of all, I would say to make sure that churches are uh, a safe place for children. So that, that's the first step, do no harm. And there will be another webinar um, in a couple of months uh, devoted specifically um, to uh, safeguarding policies or how to, exactly this point, how to make sure that uh, children are safe in the church, first of all. But then churches can go, churches and, and, and religiously motivated uh, people can go um, even um, way beyond that. Um, they can play a key role in advocacy. Uh, so we know that churches and religious leaders are, can be powerful uh, advocates for children. And they can raise awareness about th this data that I just shared and the effect of uh, violence against children. Uh, mm -hmm. And finally, they can promote um, positive discipline. 
Um, and very often this goes also through theology uh, by clarifying um, those that are misinterpretations of uh, religious texts that often are used to justify and perpetrate this violence. Um, the way that, that they can do it is, for example, engaging um, the audience through sermons, um, or uh, facilitating dialogue in their communities with families uh, and last but not least using those um, rights, uh, religious rights or key moments in the religious life, uh, spiritual life of a person um, in order to uh, provide parents with uh, uh, information and with resources. These moments can be for example uh, premarital counseling or baptism or any really um, important the moment depending on, on, on your community. So I would stop here because it was just, just really to give a um, glance of, uh, um, of the problem and what, uh, what um, you can do about it. And uh, I, we will uh, proceed now to hear uh, concrete examples about some churches that uh, are already working to this effect. a lot, Katarina. I think as you have given all the background already, I will move straight to Jennifer Ruppel so that we can hear a testimonial from the field, a testimonial from Uruguay, where we have um, Clavis, um, the project which was developed by Juventud para Cristo. And I'm here with um, giving the floor to you, Jennifer. I hope it worked from the technical side. Normally, you should now be able to um, click on your presentation. Oops. Jennifer? Uh, I think Jennifer had... Um, but maybe loading back. Jennifer, are you back online? I think I had some connection trouble. I'm sorry. Ah, Let's see if I can there. share the uh, presentation. Okay, there we go. I was surprised by Jennifer being so fluent in English, <laughs> but then I learned that you are actually originally from, from the US, right? So we're very lucky to yeah, have an uh, English presentation. I'm originally from the U.S. and I've been living and working here in Uruguay for the last six years with Clavis. So it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for everyone uh, making the time to uh, get together and think about this very important issue. <laughs> I'd just like to present briefly Clavis. Clavis started in 1995 as part of the work of Youth for Christ in Uruguay. Um, Youth for Christ was working in in different neighborhoods in Montevideo and needed to respond to a concrete situation of sexual abuse. And that's where the Clavis program got its start. Basically, the team that was working at that moment said, we don't have the tools that we need to respond to this situation. And we don't have the tools that we need to prevent other potential situations of sexual abuse from occurring. And that's when a multidisciplinary team got together and started uh, thinking creatively about the problem and, and different ways that we can interact as faith communities. Um, so Claves uh, seeks to work um, to develop strategies uh, that empower individuals in the face of violence. And we especially work to promote fair and caring interactions and treatment of children and adolescents. And you can see our, our vision is that each child and adolescent would be able to enjoy a full life and be respected in their human uh, rights and dignity. Our framework, we come to this issue from a Christian worldview, Christian anthropology, um, what we call in Latin America, Misión Integral, or holistic mission, integral mission, uh, considering children's rights, gender justice, generational inclusion. We also seek to promote youth participation, as well as uh, empowering each child's uh, own resilience 
and uh, basing our, our interventions on that resilience. Um, and all of our methodologies are prevention focused approaches. So we don't do uh, any direct attention to victims. Uh, it's extremely important, but what we're focused on is giving uh, and developing tools that can be used uh, for prevention. And the ways that we intervene are through uh, publishing teaching materials for use with children, with teens, families, and communities, training leaders, teachers, and professionals to implement those materials in their communities. We also develop uh, public awareness campaigns. Uh, we do biblical and theological reflection. We work often through national and international networks, and the World Council of Churches is part of that as well. And um, we seek to share these methodologies across culture using um, the adaptation. Um, they're very flexible methodologies, so we seek to, to um, adapt to cultural, different cultural contexts as well. And what I'd like to talk about today, sorry, it looks like the font has <laughs> changed a little bit, but um, is what we call the Fair and Caring Treatment Campaign. Uh, this is a campaign that started 16 years ago here in Uruguay, uh, and it's a campaign that's led primarily by teens, adolescents, and youth uh, advocating for children's rights, for the fair and caring treatment of children, and to prevent violence against children. So like I said, this, this initiative started in 2003. Uh, it's been shared in 18 countries throughout Latin, Latin America, as well as uh, two experiences in Europe. Uh, and thousands of teens have trained and uh, participated in the cam campaign along with their adult mentors. Um, and it's carried out by a wide variety of organizations uh, from the public, public schools, private schools, churches, um, clubs, nonprofits, uh, different youth groups that decide that they'd like to join the effort and um, train and, and carry out the campaign in their local context. So it's a very flexible methodology that seeks to really put teens at the forefront um, of, of their own uh, advocacy. And the first step of joining the campaign is a training workshop uh, that we carry out where adults and um, adult mentors and teens uh, train in uh, facilitating peer workshops. So workshops that they'll take back to their church or to their school and they'll uh, do a process of raising awareness in their own institution. They also learn how to organize a public awareness campaign on a community level. So whether it be in the local plaza or in their church, in their school, with their um, their soccer club or what have you, um, they have the tools so that they're able to carry out that campaign in their local context. And they also train um, on creative and artistic musical techniques. Um, for public awareness intervention. And I'll show some pictures later, but um, here the idea is to give teens the tools to have a, um, an activity that will draw people's attention, that will bring people into the conversation, that will be something that they can enjoy and um, feel that they're able to show off their, their abilities as well. And um, be able to create some sort of noise so that um, they'll be able to interact with, with adults in their community uh, and share the information of the campaign. So, like I said, the public awareness phase um, through creative activities, teens catch the attention of adults and they challenge them to be symbolically vaccinated against violence towards children and adolescents. And you can see there, there's a small vaccine card um, where the teens will fill out the adult's name who has decided that they want to commit to fair and caring treatment of children. Um, and they'll ask them for some specific commitments such as listening to children when they talk about situations of violence, 
believing the children's, uh, what children tell us, protecting children, and also reporting situations of violence if it's necessary. Um, and you can see there the the vaccine itself is a um, is a is a candy, a hard candy. So it doesn't hurt. It's not a it's not a shot. Um, it's something that can be enjoyable and fun, and um, that adult can go home and tell their family, "I got vaccinated today um, for fair and caring treatment." So it's something that's meant to be a, a positive reminder that we all have a responsibility to protect children. And here you can see this is on the steps of uh, the Uruguayan parliament. Um, the teens are doing a flash mob, which was one of their uh, ideas for public uh, intervention uh, activities. But um, they've also done percussion, um, different groups do face painting, um, different diff just different activities that are um, that are able to draw people's attention. So, okay, so as far as, um, sorry, the title is in Spanish still, the principal results of the campaign, I mean results. Um, so the positive and creative promotion of children's rights, uh, raising awareness of violence against children and adolescents, reinforcing adults' responsibility, like I mentioned, um, generating advocacy through youth participation, Let's see. For some reason, it, it keeps changing on my screen. Um, okay. Creating space for um, exchange between generations, um, between social groups, different social classes, um, and different organizations and as well as positioning adults as facilitators. Um, so we, we um, work a lot with uh, Pablo Freire's um, pedagogy, um, and we consider adults to be facilitators in a learning process um, where youth are the protagonists. Um, and this also, the campaign also contributes to overcoming negative stereotypes that often surround youth. At least here in Latin America and in Uruguay, youth are often shown um, when something negative has happened um, in the media. They're often shown as delinquents or connected to um, drugs or other social problems. And so it's a great way to show youth in an in a active and um, protagonistic role. And here we have a, a picture from... Uh, a picture from last year's campaign um, where one of the adolescents is vaccinating um, the head of Child Protective Services in Uruguay. That's a question. Can everyone else see the presentation? Okay. Okay. And um, the main effects in the life of teens. Sorry, the titles are in Spanish there. Um, so their personal behavior changes, um, teens question and reflect on the ways that they interact with one another and also are able to visualize violence in their own um, context and be able to react in, in healthier ways. Um, it helps build self-esteem and build leadership capacity um, when teens feel heard and valued for their abilities and their opinions are taken into account. Um, we also uh, seek to generate an integration and inclusion of different social contexts, um, encouraging teamwork and recognition of youth's abilities, um, and the fact that they're able to be team or peer facilitators and also facilitate a learning process with other adults and with children. Uh, and it's also an exercise in citizenship. Uh, active participation in this issue can help um, teens to see what are other things that they, in their context, that they would like to see changed and that they want to be involved in. So it's really a, um, oftentimes a first experience of um, a civic interaction and of civic participation um, that can have greater impact later on, even after the teens have finished uh, participating in the campaign. 
And here is a picture of painting faces from one of the campaign events. And so um, after about 10 years of um, sharing this methodology throughout the continent, uh, Claves started the Fair and Caring Interactions Network, um, which seeks to strengthen and connect the different campaigns throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, and to promote a culture of fair and caring treatment. Um, because we know that this is a, it's a common problem throughout Latin America. Latin America is one of the, is the continent with the highest rates of violence against children. And so we, we need to act together um, as a protective network for children. So within the network, um, participants share experiences, trainings, and teaching tools, and also um, are able to develop a common uh, network of an, an agenda uh, to create greater levels of advocacy for children's rights. And I have a few videos there if um, we can send the, the links afterwards that um, you'll be able to see, but I, I don't know how I'm doing on time. So, so, so part of the training that um, we do with the, with the teams is how to deal with different reactions on the street. Um, not everyone is ready to have a conversation. Not everyone is in a, at a good time to, to think about um, uh, this responsibility. So um, we definitely deal with that and that possibility. Um, but the idea is to uh, draw attention through creative activities like flash mobs, um, percussion groups. Um, we've used uh, different costumes, um, miming activities, basically any anything uh, creative and colorful and uh, play-based um, can be used to draw attention. We one year, um, like I was mentioning. Um, Different groups got onto the bus, is, uh, the bus system here in Montevideo and um, sang a song and then uh, vaccinated the, the bus riders. Um, so there's different different activities, and that um, a lot of times comes from the creativity of the youth. Um, there's always different ideas that are coming up. So. And uh, also another thing which you mentioned uh, yesterday, which is particularly interesting, I find for secular countries where churches are sometimes looked at in a different way. Um, so you're actually making, you're collaborating a lot with secular partners, right? And the, the, the reality of the program, while it is, its origin is from the church, it, people wouldn't necessarily notice that it's uh, faith-based, or is it correct? Yeah, so Uruguay is a quite secular environment, and um, we seek to bring together different groups uh, from the religious sector, from the non-religious sector, from the public sector, from um, basically bring together all sorts of um, groups that work with youth that would be interested in, in carrying out this campaign. Um, it's also a non-partisan campaign, so we don't uh, do partisan um, political activity um, but then of course um, each group has their own identity so if a, if a church youth group participates um, of course they'll have their their identity as uh, people of faith that are carrying out this campaign um, but it's on a whole the the message is not a religious message it's a um, uh, a secular message that um, is able to reach the society at large. Are there any questions from participants? Uh, I have a question, uh, Ronya from Child Health Line International. Um, what a great project, it's really interesting to hear and I, I uh, love the focus on youth participation uh, in ending violence against children as well. I really think that's a really great way, uh, the best way probably to do it as well. Uh, I was wondering if Clavis have worked with Linea Sol, which is the child helpline in Uruguay. 
I'm sorry, cut out just at the end. You're asking about the Linea Azul? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we, um, all of our materials include the, the, it's the blue hotline, which is the hotline to report violence here. Um, and so all of our materials, the campaign materials, include the information on how to report a situation of violence against children or a suspected situation. Um, and that is also a continuous uh, pressure that we have placed on on the Child Protective Services here in now uh, in Uruguay that um, truly their, their response is not adequate to that hotline. Um, but we need to keep continue that pressure on uh, the government so that there is an adequate response. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so looking at the time, uh, maybe I would uh, like to then invite you, um, Ronja, to start with your presentation. Yes. Um, Are you doing, uh, putting it on the screen or am I trying to do that? <laughs> because uh, I, because it, you were not um, sure if it was properly installed, right? Yes, I think it is. Let's it see. is. Oh, yeah, it is okay, it's easier now. if you take, do it yourself. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's working now. Well, you can't see it if you want to follow yeah. me, Sabina and Mr. Ecofe, if you want to look at the screen because she wants a... Uh, <coughs> Can everyone see? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Great. Um, so, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, we are really excited to be here presenting today. Uh, and we hope that this presentation uh, will be uh, well, both a starting point uh, for churches and child health lines to work together, uh, but I also know it already happens, so also an inspiration for more uh, collaborative work. Uh, yeah. Let's go to the next slide. There. Um, we didn't know it was video, so there's also photos of me and Richard in this presentation. <laughs> but my name is Ronja, Ronja Olsert, uh, and I'm the Inclusion Manager at Child Health International. And I'm Richard Tombolo, I'm the Senior Program Manager at Child Health International. Uh, so just briefly about uh, our organization. Uh, we are a global network of 181 members, uh, child helplines, uh, based in 147 countries. Uh, and the core, at the core of our work is the uh, child's right to be heard. Uh, and our, our, mission, or our motto is that uh, every child has a voice and no child should be left unheard. Um, whereas the child helplines uh, support and respond directly to children and young people, uh, our role is more uh, to work with uh, policy and advocacy and also to build capacity uh, among our networks uh, by listening uh, to the people who listen to their children every day. Uh, this is a very brief overview of our members. Uh, as you can see, we have members all over the world. Uh, and there's also a link in there uh, where you can find all of our members in, in all countries as well. Richard, do you want to do the next slide and I'll try and get the the, uh, um, the video going while you talk? Yeah, yeah? yeah. And we, we wanted just to um, to show you how Child plant operates. And it was an example of uh, NPCC uh, Child plant in the UK. So actually, um, most of our, our, our member child helpline are offering uh, support and advice to children and young people through phone, to uh, digital means. Um, some are using dropping centers, uh, postal services, and radio um, outreach activities. So um, uh, child helpline are not offering all those services in all the countries. So each country have a, a own model and use the the means that the thing they uh, they are more uh, appropriate to for children to to reach out to the to the child line so you can have phone in, in the uk phone and digital other digital means like uh, web and chat in, in the uk but we have dropping centers in 
in, in Zimbabwe, for example, we have postal services in, in Zambia, we have radios, uh, um, we have one in Namibia, uh, we have also one in uh, uh, Bangladesh, uh, we have outreach activities in, uh, through caravan uh, uh, in Cambodia, for example. So each country has its own means of, uh, um, from which uh, children can, can reach out to, to the child helpline. But m most of those of the child helpline should be easily accessible and should also provide with high quality and uh, confidential services to uh, young people and, and children calling the, the child helpline. So um, who can get in touch with, uh, who can contact our member child helpline in, in countries? So mainly they are children because they are the ones suffering of uh, violence, uh, but also uh, parents, uh, teachers, and uh, maybe all uh, other related, uh, significant adults to ask for child-related uh, advices and and make referral at the at, at the end. Next slide, please. Yeah. Uh, do you should I do the video? Or do you want to do the next slide? Yeah, you can do the next slide, and we can do the video. Yeah. Okay. So, um, what is the uh, the link between between child helplines and child protection system at the end? So, for us, child child, child plan are one of the entry points. Of, uh, of the child protection system. And from uh, child helpline, all children and young people in, um, uh, in need of care and, uh, and in need of care and protection can reach out to all the services around uh, offered by, by uh, other, um, other partners in the, in the country. We have also a, a more large role in, in fragile uh, child protection system because we are uh, making sure that uh, the children and young people can reach out to other, um, uh, other partners uh, through, our, um, through, through the child helpline. And um, yeah, we are also contributing to improving the child protection system through uh, our data collection. Uh, every year we collect data from our members, and uh, from this data we we have um, we produce um, document of we have several document on violence against children each year. Uh, in those documents, you can have the gap between uh, what is actually done in each country, or maybe in uh, in the region, or maybe uh, globally. And uh, from also uh, those uh, data, um, the the politics can also improve improve the. Uh, the, the, the policy at the country level and the, the, those that can also be helpful for uh, both government, uh, international organization, UN and other partners involved in child protection uh, to uh, adapt their program and also to um, to, to develop a project. So um, as for example in, in Zambia, uh, the, the child helpline was the basis for, to improve the um, they, they call the uh, child protection uh, system in community because uh, from the data that were collected from child helpline they were able to make sure that uh, the uh, at the community level they are uh, addressing issues at the at the at the county level they are also addressing some issues and at the at the regional level they are also addressing some issues and at the at the at the country level they are also addressing some issues in zimbabwe for example uh, the data collected by child helpline are helpful both for the government and other partners uh, working um, in the child protection system both to improve uh, the services they are rendering to children and also to to make sure that all the projects that the government is uh, is the, um, is working on, and all the projects that the other the, the, the other organization are also uh, uh, developing, are in line with what the data shows as uh, the gap in the in the child protection system. So, only if, if possible, if you can have the video. Yeah. Yeah. I reckon I can chat to anyone about anything. Well, almost anything. My mum says I could talk behind the girl for donkey, whatever that means. But I had this problem. I couldn't talk about it because I didn't think anyone I knew would understand. It just seemed to keep getting bigger and bigger in my head. So I thought I might speak to Childline. I'd heard you could talk to them about anything. My mate Chris said his cousin had called them about bullying. He reckons talking to them really helps. Plus it was completely free. But it's not like I could chat to him for myself. So how was I going to find out? I mean, who would I be talking to? What would happen? And would anyone else get to know about it? I didn't want the whole world knowing my business, least of all my mum. So 
So I went on the Childline site again and found loads of information. Like I saw that you can talk to Childline online as well as call them. It works the same way as on the phone, it's just that you're typing instead of talking. Either way, I'd be in charge of what was said and what would happen next. They weren't going to go passing it on, so I could trust them with as much or as little as I wanted to say. Whatever I preferred. I could even give them a different name if it made it easier. I thought about chatting online, but I guess I'd find it easier to talk about stuff, so I decided to phone. I checked when I could call, and it said any time, so I just went for it. After I dialed the number, I felt really sick. I was thinking about hanging up, but I'd come this far, so what did I have to lose? Then someone answered. This man said hi, you through to child life. I've got this problem, I said. I don't think anyone will understand. Would you like to talk to someone about it, he said. Yeah, I said, but I don't want my mum to find out. He said that was fine. The call would just be between me and the counsellor, unless they thought someone's life was in real danger. That was the only bit that might change things. That seemed fair enough. So he said he put me in a queue to talk to a counsellor. All I had to do was stay on the line for a bit. So I waited, and I was starting to feel, oh, how can I do this? But after a while, this woman, the counsellor, came on the line. I couldn't get my words out first. Not like me. But she said, don't worry, take your time. So I told her all about it. She was great. She didn't talk too much to start off. She just let me say everything. Then she asked if it had been hard to call. Yeah, I said, but this has helped. I asked her, what do you reckon I should do? She asked me if I had any ideas. So we started talking again. We figured out that I had some choices and they could all work out in different ways. I could see there was something I could do to change stuff after all. That was amazing. Just doing that. All of a sudden, it felt like I had a plan. It wasn't like I made an idiot of myself and I had a plan to the entire world. The call wouldn't even appear on the phone bill. It felt like I was in charge and I could really trust them. They just listened and helped me decide what I wanted to do. It felt great. So let's see if I can get the presentation back. Yeah, maybe when you are when you are trying to have the presentation again, uh, we just uh, want to mention that um, uh, most of our member child plan in Europe are reachable to the one one six one 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 number. And I in I just came back from Uganda on Sunday. Trying to make it work. Is it Yeah, sorry. Maybe, maybe maybe before going before before going forward, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, we have some um, child help plans are reachable through a short 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 number, mainly three 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 digital um, two digital numbers. Uh, in Europe, it is the one one six one 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 number. It's long. Uh, I can understand, but in Africa, it is uh, mostly one one six number. And in Europe, uh, in, in the in Asia, they are actually working on to have the one zero nine a uh, nine eight number. All the uh, yes, we can also mention that all the members of are not using that number up to now, but we are working towards uh, to make sure that all uh, all of them are using the same number in the uh, in the same region. It is mainly because of the trafficking, because we wanted uh, if a children is trafficked in one country uh, to another country, then you can you can uh, easily um, contact the child helpline to to ask for help and, and protection. Yeah, let's move on to the next one. Uh, so one of the things that we do as well, uh, as Richard uh, discussed, is that we collect the data from child helplines uh, on the reasons for contact. So basically, why children contact a child helpline. Uh, and this is our data from 2016. Uh, so as you can see, we had uh, almost 500,000 contacts on abuse and violence. Um, and you can see we've done a breakdown between the different uh, forms, the different categories of abuse. Uh, but I think it's more important to point out uh, that there's still quite a few uh, of these contacts that are still unheard uh, due to uh, child health is not having the resources to pick up and answer every call. Uh, so that's one big part of our work, uh, to make sure that all children are heard and all uh, all calls are answered. 
Yeah, on that one, may I just give the floor to Sabine Rakotomalala from the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children, because she also just came back from Uganda and had some observations on that, which are probably important to be aware of. Yes. Yeah, hi. This is Sabine. Um, yeah, I just came back from Uganda last week, and I was in really, I was training um, there for about 50 people. And one of the interesting things is that the Violence Against Children survey shows that about maximum one out of 10 children accesses any types of services. And so probably, whereas we know that three out of four children is victim of sexual abuse, and or one out of three children, sorry, is victim of sexual abuse, and one out of four children is victim of physical violence. And if you know that maybe 5 or 10% of those actually access services yeah. because they dare to access services. Uh, that's interesting. So I was wondering, um, and so probably, and there's a child helpline which works, uh, which is there and functions, but probably children don't go to them. Do you have any outreach services to make sure that you're getting down to those communities to make sure that they call the helpline and that, that they actually then receive the services that they need? Um, so our role, because we are in the network organisation, so our role is to, to set the minimum quality standards for the child helplines uh, and uh, outreach and awareness raising and reaching out to uh, the more vulnerable communities is definitely uh, part of what we do, uh, but then it's down to each and every child helpline to put that into practice. Um, so I know that there's a lot of awareness raising uh, projects and outreach going on. Uh, but obviously, if, if only 5 to 10 percent are actually accessing any form of support, obviously that's something that needs to be stepped up quite significantly. Do you want to add yeah. something? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, sorry, thank I you just for have to be um, careful with the timing. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is a very important observation, but I would suggest that we move the discussion to afterwards to be sure that we have enough time. Yeah. What I would like to retain from it is two things. Is uh, One, that uh, it's important for churches to know that this child helpline exists in many countries. And um, depending on the interest of churches, I think it could be discussed also at country levels. If some churches may also be helping to staff uh, through volunteers some helplines if they receive the right training. Yeah. And how some of the gaps, uh, which are very um, important to keep in mind, Sabine mentioned these problems, I think this uh, problem of not being picked up, like children phoning and then no response being given, that is yeah. terrible. And of course, the, maybe we can look at solutions also to how to help to uh, fix that in the countries where this is a problem. Yeah. So thanks a lot uh, for your presentation on Child Help and International. My feeling is that there could be a lot to be explored in the strong goodwill from churches to do more for child protection and in the potential of child helplines for this area. But now if I may ask uh, you, Valerie, from the Anglican Church in Canada, um, you are a pastor, Reverend uh, Dr. Valerie Michelson, and you're going to present to us how in Canada Christian theologies are used to end corporal punishment. I would like to give you the floor. Excellent. Thank you so much. Can I now, how do I get my slides up? Just press share. Yes. Can I get my slides? Yes, you will Not you sure. On slide. Okay. And, oh, there we are. Okay, great. Thank you so much. I'm so um, delighted to be here. Can you see my slides? Okay, go ahead. Okay, it's up for me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here uh, representing a project that I am very committed to, but working with a fantastic team. So um, representing about 30 people in what I'm presenting this morning. I'm at Queen's University in the Department of Public Health Sciences and also the School of Religion and started to work on corporal punishment several years ago because it's a public health concern here in Canada. Well, many people, many countries have banned corporal punishment. In Canada, it still remains legal. Um, physical punishment of children is protected by Section 43 of our criminal code. One of the barriers to repealing this law in Canada comes from strong voices within Christian groups, which we see as um, a, a theological issue that has a lot of misunderstanding around 
Christian texts that are used to support corporal punishment. So a number of us have seen this as a theological problem because we think that there's a better theological message that can be given. And in Canada, is this is also an Indigenous issue. Uh, over the last decade, our Truth and Reconciliation Commission has shed light on the incredible abuses that has happened to Indigenous issues in Canada. And one of the things that has been recognized is that corporal punishment was used and caused incredible harm. So the effects of corporal punishment are not just towards Indigenous issues, but that it really came to light as a Canadian issue in our Truth and Reconciliation um, commission calls to action and calls to action six is for a repeal of the law that protects the corporal punishment of children. And so we had three things going on at once, a public health issue and uh, a theological issue and an indigenous issue. And what we wondered was, if, could we all get on the same page and work together to try to move this issue forward? So in 2017, um, Canada celebrated our 150th anniversary and there were all kinds of uh, research opportunities to do things to um, that would be positive for Canada. So we proposed a grant where public health researchers and Christian theologians and church leaders and indigenous church leaders would work together on call to action six and we received funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council and the School of Religion at Queen's to do this project. So our purpose was to bring together public health evidence, the experience of Indigenous peoples in Canada and Christian theologies, and our hope was to provide a concrete and hopeful evidence-based and theologically rich way forward for the church in Canada. Sometimes we think, oh, um, we pat ourselves on the back and we think Canada, we're so, um, we're doing well in a lot of fronts, but actually um, many, many countries have banned this and Canada is far behind on this. Some of my colleagues and I recently did a quantitative study of Canadian children and looked at religious involvement and uh, both experience of violence um, as victims and as perpetrators of violence. And to our great concern, children who were religiously connected in Canada had a higher likelihood of either being victims or um, perpetrators of violence than kids who were not connected. This was just published this week in the Journal of Interpersonal Violence. So we were just very concerned that churches in Canada are not maximizing the potential to being helpful. And actually, children who are involved in a religion in Canada are actually disadvantaged. And so we need to be very intentional about this. Very um, pleased by the strong team who have been involved in this. Our Indigenous leaders included Bishop Mark McDonald, who is the Anglican Indigenous Bishop in Canada, several other <laughs> and just a, a fantastic leadership he was our indigenous lead on this project and has been with us every step of the way from start to finish um bishop priscilla walshaw as well and equally important many survivors of the cycle of violence who are indigenous christians have provided their insight mr clarence hale was one of those so we were delighted by this many church leaders i don't have time to name them all but dr venerable michael thompson who's the general secretary of the Anglican church of canada and Reverend John Young, who's the executive minister of theological leadership. These national level leaders, we hoped having their voice would help us bring on board churches at national levels. The United Church made a very strong statement about corporal punishment about a decade ago. Other churches are being slow to get on board, but we are hoping that through um, public events like this and media, um, other actions that they're going to come on board. We've had some very strong theological leaders on board. I just draw your attention to Dr. Marsha Bungie, who has done some of the cutting edge pioneering work in um, biblical theologies of children and ch um, her books have been 
pivotal in drawing attention to the rich theological work that is being done about children. So Marcia has been one of our theological leads and many others as well, and public health researchers. And I'll just draw your attention to Dr. Joan Durant, who has been over decades working with Save the Children and working in positive discipline. When I got to know Joan two years ago and I said, would you like, to, I phoned her out of the blue and said, we're trying to, I'd like to do something with Christian theology to work on call to action six. And, and Joan said, I've been waiting for this phone call for decades. I would love to get on board. So Joan has been a key player in our project as well. We got together in Kingston in October, a, a bunch of us, and, and um, wrote the Christian Theological Statement in support of the TRC's Call to Action 6. We started off with um, the background in terms of this being an Indigenous issue. Dr. Durant provided a strong and powerful evidence-based about why this needs to change. But I'll just draw your attention to the theological pieces. We all agreed that a full reading of scripture in light of the revelation of Jesus is incompatible with physical punishment. And doctors Bill Morrow and Marsha Bungie provided a very strong theological platform for us. I'll point you to our website at the end where you can see this in more detail. But over, an overview is that we affirmed the following biblical principles that children are sacred gifts from God, they deserve dignity and re respect, they enrich the whole community, and they are also in, um, at the same time as they are strong and capable, they also deserve nurture, protection, and justice. And so we are calling Canadian churches um, to recognize that they have a duty to call for the repeal of section 43 as a vital step towards reconciliation. And we are doing this out of a place of faith. So our recommendations for churches in Canada are to petition the government to repeal section 43. This is particularly important because it is the faith voice that has been blocking this over decades. And we need the government to hear that there is another rich theological interpretation and that we actually really believe this is out of a place of faith that we want to change this law. Uh, also calling churches to address the issues stemming from colonialism more fully in the way that they continue to impact Indigenous children in Canada. Increase awareness of the impact of violence and to join in the work that um, the rest of you have presented this morning that is so encouraging. We need to do that in Canada as well. Endorse, endorse the joint statement on the physical punishment of children and youth, which is a Canadian initiative. Be active in the protection of children and also develop healthy, effective and non-violent approaches to discipline and to do that framed in Christian theologies, because what we recognize is that evidence isn't what change practices, that in fact we need to frame um, new practices in people's beliefs and help them understand that you don't have to give up your faith to change these practices. Our evidence and our theologies are leading us in a more positive direction for children. So we had 22 original signatories uh, from public health researchers, theologians, church leaders, community members, people, I think our youngest signatory was 22 and our oldest was about 70 across the um, denominations. And just last month, our largest endorsement came from the Presbytery of Ottawa, from the Presbyterian Church of Canada. And we're hoping, we've been uh, actually a bit disappointed to now that um, denominations have not supported, but we are working on that. And my hope is maybe they're even watching this webinar and we'll start to get some momentum behind this. Um, where it's led is um, overall, our message is that corporal punishment has been perpetuated through centuries based on a range of theologies that are used to put children in our place, in their place. But we actually believe that Jesus put children in a very different place, in the center of his disciples. And so Dr. Durant and I are writing a book right now called Putting Children in Their Place. 
uh, Corporal Punishment, Christian Theologies and Reconciliation. And our, we are anticipating that it will be published in early 2019 by the University of Manor. University of Manitoba Press, where our truth and reconciliation work is being housed in Canada. But our goal is that we're putting together very strong theological and evidence and practical base. So our, our hope is that this will be useful beyond the Canadian context. Part one, we have Bishop McDonald, who's already, his chapter is already done and we're all drawing from it. He sets the context for why Call to Action 6 is so important. Dr. Durant has set a wonderful framework of the evidence about why we need to take this so seriously. And again, Bernadette Saunders, who's done wonderful qualitative work, uh, has also contributed a marvelous chapter. And then I framed this as well and looking at the doctrine of discovery and some other theological problems that the church in Canada needs to consider as we move this forward. Part two is a very, very strong section on Christian theologies, and we have two chapters looking specifically at Proverbs. Dr. Um, Bill Morrow at Queen's, who's an expert on uh, um, religion and violence, and also Bill Webb, who has written a book called Corporal Punishment in the Bible. So we are giving you Canada's finest <laughs> theologies here. We're really excited that all these people have been so generous in contributing this. Maybe the most novel part of the book, though, is looking at our Indigenous writers. The Indigenous writers are flagged by the medicine wheel beside their name. Two Indigenous Christians, Brother Martin Brokenleg and Shirley Tagalik, are looking at Indigenous parenting from Indigenous perspectives and what was lost in the colonialism that Canada embraced over centuries and really how much the church has to learn from Indigenous parenting. And these are very, very rich chapters. Marsha Bungie, again at her finest, is doing a theology of parenting for us that we're very, very excited about. Some fresh work from her and Ashley Stewart Tefescu, who is doing her doctoral dissertation on positive discipline, is framing this all and saying, so what does this look like? We've got these theologies, but what does this look like in practice? So um, we're hoping this is going to be a very practical book. And then our final section is looking towards reconciliation. And we have a number of Indigenous writers again. Um, Clarence Hale, who's very generously shared his own personal story. Uh, he's a Lakota um, Indigenous person, but also committed Christian, talks about his own journey towards inter, um, breaking of cycle of violence through generations in his own family, a very powerful chapter. Mary Birdsell is showing us what does this look like on the ground, because there's a lot of um, people saying, but what does this mean legally? If we repeal this law, are kids just going to get taken? And this is kind of scary for us. So we've got a lawyer working with us. Our general secretary of the Anglican Church, Michael Thompson, is reflecting on what this means. Yeah, that's funny. Out of time, maybe for the details of the chapters, we will share that also afterwards. Okay, well, I'll just let you know it's before our Senate right now. So, rallying the Christian voice is really important to us in Canada to get this going because we hope that it's going to go for vote in the next couple of months and that we can have all kinds of signatures on this. So it's not too late if anybody has ideas, we're just, the book is going to be finished this August, but if there's anything missing or endorsements or people think, oh, there's a chapter that needs to happen, we're so open to hearing that. Um, and anything that people will think uh, we need to, Dr. Durant and I need to consider, we would love to hear. So that's our project. Thank you so much for uh, letting us Share it. The full project is up on our website, churchesforchildren.net. And Valerie, also, I think a very important point, which you didn't mention, but which was on one of your slides, is that uh, prayers for success of your project and the advocacy uh, will be very much appreciated. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, maybe we can take a few questions just bef before we pass on to Sabine. Are there any particular questions right away to Valerie? I have a comment, but Let's okay. hear first for questions, if there is any. 
okay, maybe I'll say my comment then. Um, okay. No, I just I just wanted to um, first of all congratulate you for this project, which seems amazing and um, it just occurred to me how um, earlier on I was speaking about the unique role that uh, faith communities can have uh, in tackling this pro problem and um, this is really a concrete example when you were it really touched me when you were saying that evidence, evidence doesn't shape practices but it's beliefs that shape practices and this is something that in the development uh, world is uh, it, it took a while to understand I think and we we are there now <laughs> uh, better late than never and uh, that's why um, the importance uh, of um, uh, that, that's why we understood how important it is to actually partner with the faith uh, communities and um, broadly speaking, with with uh, uh, also traditional leaders, uh, depending on the on the context, of course. But because you have the power to shape practices, uh, to influence people, way more than than any law or any uh, really policy can do. But at the same time, one aspect that I really liked of your experience is the connection with the advocacy. So you're not only um, you know tackling um, the, you're, you're doing a first step which is so important of like providing a theological background uh, without which nothing can change but then you're you're bringing it to a, an even a higher level uh, making the connection with a con very concrete advocacy ask um, for for the, the the context of Canada um, also the link with indigenous issues I think was very relevant it made me think of um, well, in, 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 uh, when I was studying in, in Italy, I, I um, worked a lot uh, with the Roma communities and it made me think of how I imagine, I have a little bit lost uh, touch with, with the, that, those communities in, in the past uh, like 15 years, but I, it made, makes me in, in imagine how many problems um, probably are similar in the, in the European context with the Roma communities who have been really marginalized and, and uh, abandoned by any kind of uh, social services whatsoever throughout uh, Europe. So uh, maybe it's something that also European churches can, um, t can learn from and adapt to, to their context. And finally, just, just uh, a smile on the name of uh, Marsha Banji because uh, she was a part <laughs> of um, the theological working group that uh, we put together for the development of churches' commitments to children. So nice to hear yeah. how uh, you know some names keep keep recurring, and she keeps being a very important resource uh, for for children. Over. Thank you. Thanks a lot Thank you very much. There may be time for more discussion and questions afterwards, but I would now like to give the floor to Sabine Rakotomalala, who works in the Secretariat of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. Some of you are very familiar with it. But never, others may never have heard about it. So I would like to ask Sabina to explain it to everyone. All right, can everybody see the slides? This work. So I think you just, I'll just ask you to click. Okay, so yeah. as we set up the slide, um, I'm going to say one thing in the beginning of this presentation and one thing at the end. And it has two messages. The first one is no violence is justifiable. And the second one is that all violence against children is preventable. Now, those are two huge paradigm shifts that we're trying to make as the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. And I think exactly what, what Valerie and Katerina were just saying now, it's not about the evidence often, but it's about believing. And if we all believe that nonviolence is not justifiable and that violence is preventable, although there is evidence to support those, we need to believe it to make it happen. And we really realized that over the, the, the past three years of this work, that that's what we're struggling with most. So I'll just very quickly walk through a few slides because I really want some time for questions because I'm sure there will be, and I hope there will be. So the partnership to end violence against children was launched in 2016. And um, core to our work are three pieces. The first one is to build political will in countries. So we have Canada, that's a pathfinding country. So that's a country that's leading the way. We have a map here with, uh, with some of our pathfinding countries. 
but um, we have 21 currently, and that's, those are countries where we're seeing important political will. The second, um, yeah, here's the map, thank you. Um, the second um, pillar of the partnership is to accelerate action in country. That's my favorite pillar, because I think, like Valerie was just explaining, ending, ending corporal punishment in schools and in the homes, that should have happened yesterday. It's crazy that in Canada it's, it hasn't happened yet. Even in Switzerland, here where we sit, it hasn't happened yet. So there's so much to do. We need to accelerate this action. And then the third pillar is to share lessons learned across countries, within countries and across countries. So that, those are the three pillars of the partnership. A core tool for our partnership is this document called Inspire. You can find it. I won't go into much detail uh, of it, but within um, the World Health Organization's website, that's where I sit. The rest of my team sits in UNICEF, but I sit in the World Health Organization because we're a partnership. Um, but you can find more on Inspire um, on the World Health Organization website. Maybe two words on it. Um, Inspire is based on evidence. So WHO and UNICEF and World Bank and USAID collected all the evidence to see what actually works to end violence against children. Nobody would want to vaccinate their children with a vaccination that hasn't been tested. And somehow in violence against children, we do whatever we want. A bit of Scientology, a bit of capoeira, and everything seems to work to end violence against children. You know what? It's not true. We need to see what's working and we need to measure it and evaluate to see whether there, it actually has a reduction in violence. I don't want to be too categorical because of course there's things that haven't been evaluated that may be working, but we should aim to evaluate those just like we would evaluate, test the vaccination before injecting it into our children. INSPIRE is an acronym. Each letter stands for one of the strategies. I is uh, implementing um, laws. So I, I say implementing laws, making sure that they're happening. The second one, and that's one I'll just dive into a little bit more detail, is norms. So changing norms and values. The third one is safe environments. The fourth one is parenting programs. The fifth one is economic strengthening. R is response services. And E is education and life skills. So we've developed, we have the Inspire core package. We, have, we now have a handbook, which is a bit the how-to. How do you implement those strategies? Because otherwise, in the first package, it just says the programs and the interventions that work based on evidence, but it still doesn't tell you how to do it. So we're trying to now disseminate the handbook. We also have indicators that we've uh, um, collected, um, and then try to bring that down to country level, to community, to, through governments, with UN agencies, with civil society, with churches, down to the communities where those children are affected. Um, what can churches do? In our 21 pathfinding countries, we have coordinating platforms. We're bringing together health, education, justice, and social services. That's those ministries. But of course, 80% of the work gets done through civil society, which includes churches. I just came back from Uganda, where I was giving a training. I would say, 40% uh, were government, 60% were civil society. Of the 50 people, there were five people from church represented. And they were so engaged and they understood it better than most of the government people because they're in the communities actually dealing with these children and these women victim of violence. So make sure that the churches are part of CSO co or of, of coordination platforms in country and that they attend these trainings. CSO stands for Civil Society Organizations Platform. So in the different countries, you will hear about CSO platform that stands for Civil Society Organization Platform. Yeah, thanks. The second thing is we need to go beyond business as usual. We can't just accept this. As we said, we know it's preventable. So we need to start engaging others. We need to make sure that education, social services, health and education are sitting at the table. Last week was the World Health Assembly. We had to jump through 200 hoops to make sure that there was one small side event on violence against children for ministers of health because they don't get it. Whereas we know that when a young girl gets raped, the first place she'll probably go to is to a health center because she needs to be stitched up or because she needs to get uh, after uh, care. Um, so we need to go beyond business as usual and bring the right actors to the table. Um, also, of course, working with children with disabilities, working with refugees, with displaced people, make sure that they're part of the discussion. And then, as um, I won't go into too much detail, but we need to mobilize children. It's incredible how we can make plans about children without even asking them what they need. Do they want to see more parenting programs? Do they think it's in the social norms? What is a safe environment for them? They're the ones that will tell us. And then, um, of course, all this is linked to the Sustainable Development Goals 16.2. Um, it's being uh, in, 
in 2019, so in a year from now or in 18 months from now, governments will have to show how they're moving on 16.2, uh, which is to, to end all forms of violence against children. So we're trying to help them to assess what they're doing on violence against children so that they can report back to the United Nations on how they're moving on the Sustainable Development Goal. Next. So these are our pathfinding countries. You see they range from all sides. So we have Canada and Sweden to Georgia, Armenia, UAE, Philippines, South Africa, Nigeria. The important thing of pathfinding countries is we don't tell them what to do. They assess what they need to do. So they do data collection. Sometimes it's a violence against children survey. Sometimes it's existing data in country. Then they create a coordination group with strong political will. Then they develop a national action plan, and then hopefully in a coordinated manner, they start implementing programs to achieve change. But if a church is a, in a country that's not pathfinding, they can still do something. They can, for example, lobby the government to become a pathfinding country, no? Yeah, so yes. churches can lobby governments to become pathfinding countries. And another thing that I really recommend for churches is to be part of the Inspire Working Group, because you'll get more technical updates on what's going on in terms of parenting programs, in and basically in terms of the vaccination of what's working. And that is evolving quite quickly. So the closer you can be to what's working, the closer you can be to implementing what's working. So if we go to the next slide, I just want three things that we've really noticed um, until today, 2018, um, really much efforts have been focused on response. So the R of Inspire rather than prevention, which is crazy. Why aren't we doing the upscale work? And again, I come back from Uganda, where 80% of the resources are on dealing with cases. Prevention is working in schools, making sure that bullying is addressed, that violence in schools is addressed, working on social norms, working on parenting programs in advance so that they look after their children well so that they don't end up um, in the response uh, services. So that's an important one that Inspire promotes and that the partnership promotes. Another one is we're very focused on individual and family interventions. Where are the community interventions? We know that this lies uh, so much in social norms, the way a community behaves. And so if you can, through individual and family interventions, actually make those community interventions, or through churches, uh, th through existing community groups, it has a huge weight and can very quickly tip the balance for individuals and families. And then the last one, there's a, a strong focus on women and girls. We know that women and girls, from all the data, are more vulnerable, but uh, we thereby strangely forget boys and men. Um, I'll just go into a bit more detail uh, on a program uh, of parenting, but boys and men are so important in terms of uh, masculinity, gender, um, uh, power, and, and how we can strengthen them and help them uh, in the programs. So this is the program that I'm, I was mentioning. It's an interesting program. Uh, it's called the Real responsible, engaged, and loving fathers initiative. So it's presented as a social norms change program. But of course, you're not going to walk into a community and say, so we're going to change your social norms. I mean, that's so confronting. So it, it's more of a parenting program where young fathers are mentored to be able to deal with family dynamics, to support their wives, to look after their children, to bring their children to the creches. And again, if you look at Inspire, you'll see that there has been a significant reduction in intimate partner violence and violence against children, uh, so violence basically within the whole household. Um, so we see a direct decline of violence thanks to engaging fathers. Um, and thereby, we're changing a huge social norm because that means that even in economic strengthening programs, the mothers will have an important role to play. In parenting programs, the, the mothers will have an important role to play. Boys grow up differently. My last slide. Um, what can we all do? We need to know the facts and promote solutions that we all agree on. Those are in Inspire. The more we have, speak in a unified language, the stronger our impact will be. We need to continue sharing the evidence. We need to partner across sectors. We always need to make sure that the... And, and it was interesting in Uganda, the police officers are literally sitting at the table. The teachers are sitting at the table. The social workers are sitting at the table. And the primary health care practitioners are sitting across the ta at the table. So what the partnerships we're really trying to do is to build a movement. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about child labor or female genital mutilation or child marriage. It's, it's all part of the same thing. We need to uh, prevent violence against these children, and it's a lot of upskill work um, in order to see a reduction on violence. So this is our theory of change, really. We think that the more we 
implement Inspire in terms of the strategies um, and ideally the evidence-based interventions will see a decrease in the prevalence of violence against children. So I just want to reiterate in my closing, no violence against children is justifiable. That's a message. Even a spank is not right. We know and evidence shows that, as we see in countries like Sweden, when the, the law gets passed for violence and corporal punishment in schools and in the homes, you see a change in norms as well. So no violence is justifiable and all violence is preventable and we have the solutions to end it. Thank you very much, Sabina, for this introduction to Inspire and the Global Partnership. Just to mention that our WCC General Secretary, Reverend Dr. Olaf Füchse-Treit, is actually a member of the board of the Global Partnership to End Violence Against Children. And, um, We've uh, witnessed how much actually the churches can contribute to that partnership and we'll now start more systematically uh, rolling that out. So we were, didn't, just didn't want to confuse people because so far the focus was on um, the church's commitment to children, but working with Inspire is a good way of implementing the church's commitments to children, especially when it comes to this commitment 1B, which we are focusing on today. Um, because of the um, time, I think it will be best to directly link now to um, the presentation from Amanda Reeves on World Vision. And um, I'm wondering, Amanda, if um, you've been able to download your presentation? Um, yes, I did share it. There we go. So Amanda Reeves is working at World Vision in charge of the external engagement. And the campaign which Amanda is going to present is also closely linked to the efforts described by Sabine just before. Please go ahead, Amanda. Thank you. Can you see the slides? It looks like it's still loading. There we go. Okay. Um, because of the time, I'll just go ahead and load up a couple of the links and try to go as quickly as possible through the slides. Oh, it's not letting me share it. For those who are available to stay longer, we can also continue the discussion after or after the foreseen timing. And okay. then we can continue a lot via online and uh, email. I'll share all the resources and all the details which may not have been presented today to you with you per email. Thanks. Thank you, Frederick. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yes, great. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much to WCC. And it's great to see so many partners and familiar faces and names on the call. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, World Vision is a Christian relief development and advocacy organization that works in a, over 100 countries worldwide. Uh, we partner very closely with WCC and a number of the other organizations on the call today. I wanted to just quickly share with you a bit about our campaign, our global campaign, It Takes a World to End Violence Against Children, uh, some examples of our programming that we do in our field offices, and also provide you with some resources that may be useful. I won't go and convince this group why we need to address violence against children, but I will share with you the main objectives of our campaign. Our campaign seeks to change attitudes and behaviors around violence against children, scaling up what works. You see there very clearly represented the INSPIRE framework. We're working very closely with the Global Partnership and have contributed to that, the development of that uh, framework. We seek more money, better spent, and accountability uh, for the commitments that policymakers and decision makers are, are making, uh, partly as part of the great work that Global Partnership, of course, is doing globally. So the churches traditionally have been a key partner for World Vision as a, as a Christian organization and everything that we do in our programming, our advocacy work, and our campaign work. Um, and in the design of It Takes a World to End Violence Against Children, we convened most of our global church partners 
um, to, to determine a way forward to see how that looked like. And what we came to understand, those are not my children, actually. I'm usually the one with two little kids um, yelling in the background. I'm not sure if someone can put themselves on mute. It's not me this time. I have a three-year-old and a four-year-old. And I managed to find it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so churches and faith communities certainly play an important role in influencing the way that their congregants uh, think and act. They can be powerful community organizers, which is why we work so closely with them in our community development work. Churches can certainly and do influence policy and decision-making. And working with partners for for many of us on the call working with churches is really good stewardship and increases the, the impact of our work. So our campaign, It Takes Faith to End Violence Against Children, I want to draw your attention to, to two uh, upcoming key moments. The entire month of June, our offices, and again, we have operations or programs or support in over 100 countries around the world. In the month of June, we will have lots of activities going on. So I invite you to connect with your national counterparts. There'll be a lot happening on social media. There will be conversations happening, dialogues. And specifically on the 10th of June, we'll be partnering with WCC and a number of um, Christian partners, Christian organizations and, and, and partners in the Global Day of Prayer. Now, this is um, highlighting famine, but we've adapted the Day of Prayer this year to also include the important issues of violence against children and, and link to our campaign that we share with our, our global church partners. Uh, there's the, the website, and I'm sure Frederic will send this out with the notes as well. We also have, in October, planned a Faith Action for Children on the Move, the Global Partners Forum. This is um, being organized by faith partners. Right now we have 14 co-organizers on board, and we decided to really focus in on violence against children on the move, at least for this year or the next year, as part of our campaign work. Uh, so just this week, I'm also in Geneva and I've been meeting with Frederic and, and others to create an action plan for faith actors, for churches, for other faiths to, to get behind so that we can address violence against children, specifically those that are on the move, refugees, IDPs, migrants. So, so please watch that space. The link there will take you to a call for submissions that's being organized by our academic uh, partner, JLI, the Joint Learning Initiative. Uh, it technically closed on the 25th of May, but the site is still working, so please go ahead and upload your submissions. Very quickly, World Vision um, works in a number of areas focused on child well-being and the most vulnerable, health, nutrition, education, livelihoods, and much of that work is increasingly trying to address violence against children. Of course, our child protection work is very much focused on back. And I'd like to just very quickly highlight um, channels of hope, which I think could be one of the methodologies most of interest to the churches and church partners on the call. This is a methodology and a process which targets faith leaders. Uh, we've traditionally done this with churches. The methodology has been adapted for the, the Muslim community now as well in partnership with Islamic Relief. Uh, and the goal is to empower faith communities with the knowledge and tools to take action to contribute to the well-being of children based on their reality and context. There's a really quick snapshot of what that workshop looks like. Uh, to date, we estimate that we've reached over 10 million congregation members globally. Uh, the methodology addresses a number of issues. I won't go into that. But for Channels of Hope Child Protection, we uh, have been implementing this for a number of years, as you can see with, with millions of folks. And you can read the slide for yourself, but suffice to say, it uses a methodology that is theologically based, scripture based, and creates a change of heart that definitely leads to, to a change in action. So if you are in one of World Vision's uh, contexts where we have national programs, this is something that we can partner with you on. We implement this methodology in dozens of countries. We're operational in nearly 60. And it's a wonderful methodology that, that, that churches have found very appropriate. Um, the, the methodology itself is not available in open source only because we want to be able to train and, and ensure that it's being uh, implemented 
correctly, but please do contact us if you'd like more information about channels of hope child protection. This is more relevant to um, the commitments to churches 1A, but we also offer a lot of support to churches in becoming a child safe organization that's part of the Channels of Hope curriculum. We also have many regions and field offices which have contextualized materials and training offices to help churches develop their own child protection uh, policies, uh, protocols, as well as incident management that's been really, really uh, welcomed by churches. And lastly, I'm just flying through this, and Frederic will share the uh, links, but these are a few free resources that are available with our church partners, including WCC. We developed a theological narrative, a biblical and theological basis for ending by Violence Against Children that's available. We have Lent and Advent resources that are targeted at church leaders and pastors, which can really be used at any time of the year. There's no right or wrong way to use those resources. They are available to you. And finally, the Matthew 25 challenge, uh, which is not, which is, you know, the, the, the scripture. It covers a number of areas, including um, the stranger, the, the, the person that is hungry, that's thirsty. Um, and it is a really cool resource. I've done some of it with my family. You can do it with youth groups, with different clubs. Anybody can access it. It's a lot of fun. And we're also working on developing, adapting that a bit more to focus on migration, fragile context, and the violence that the most vulnerable um, of us experience. And that being children. So thank you so much. Sorry that was so quick, but I know we're probably out of time. This is a link to our campaign website and a generic email address that you can reach us at as well. And I'm Amanda Rives, uh, and Frederic can get you in touch with me too. Thanks so much. Thank you, Amanda. Now straight away to questions for Amanda from the participants. Um, if you'd like to use this opportunity to ask any questions, I think we can still take a moment for that. And as Amanda said, I'll also make available the context if you want to have bilateral exchanges for follow-up on all these opportunities of capacity building. So really, in a nutshell, I think what uh, is the vision for the Church's Commitment 1B is that, that the churches worldwide really become recognized by society and by children in particular as a place where they will find support. And we've heard from Helpline International also how many countries have uh, trained people who can guide and support children through confidential conversations. If, for example, worldwide, the churches would have stickers with a toll-free help number or posters in the church buildings giving children information about those toll-free numbers, I think a lot could be achieved because from my um, surveys and experience here, a lot of children have no idea that such help systems exist. But we also know from the research that those who have used um, support from Child Helpline, in uh, many cases, just the listening and the confidential opportunity to speak out about what they're suffering from that can be a very big step for finding solutions in the environment and finding solutions themselves. So I encourage all of you to consider um, all these existing support structures, be it Helpline, uh, be it World Vision, the Inspire package, and the Clavis experience. Um, maybe you can just um, take more time to go through the details which were presented and talk with your community about what could be done to amplify what you're already doing and to ensure that every child which comes to your churches finds uh, information on what to do if they are suffering from violence. So I would like to thank you all very much for taking the time for this webinar. For those who want to stay uh, longer, don't hesitate. We can continue discussing, and maybe some of the resource people are available to stay on as well. I know this technology is not uh, necessarily um, very comfortable to have a chat just like that. Some of you are more or less experienced with it, but um, I mean, don't hesitate to just unmute yourself and speak.
or send a little message in the chat section. Also the book which uh, Valerie presented, when it's going to be available, we'll make sure that you all know how to find it. And as uh, Valerie presented, all this um, effort in Canada could be of great value for ending corporal punishment in other countries as well. Um, those of you who participated in developing the Church's commitments to children know how tricky the discussion on that issue was. And we know that we have member churches where it's not uh, obvious to stop uh, corporal punishment. So I think that all these theological reflections could be of great benefit to many of our member churches. Tarina, would you like to add anything? Um, no, this was a space for uh, if there was in case there was any other question, but I think people have been asking questions uh, throughout the webinar. So um, I'm checking the chat and I see a lot of thank you and people um, asking to make sure we get the presentation. Of course, uh, everything will be shared. Um, so just to thank everybody again one last time and um, uh, we'll continue our series of webinars. As we said, the, the next one will be on uh, specifically on uh, um, safeguarding policies within a church. So make sure that the church is a safe place. Um, and there should be more uh, in, throughout the year on um, climate justice and on uh, migrants and, and children on move in general. So stay tuned. That's it. Yes, stay tuned. And the date of the webinar on safeguarding may change. It was originally planned for 12th of June, but we are waiting for a big announcement also in terms of capacity building of our member churches in general. So we will um, reconfirm the exact timing of that webinar. Very soon. It should be at the end of June, beginning of July anyway, right? Yeah, around this time. Yeah. Thank you. So thank, thank, thank you, you everyone. A nice day, afternoon, and evening to everybody. <laughs> this is uh, Mr. Etofe from Forum Engelberg, who has joined us today from Bern, right? Yeah, because, and uh, Forum Engelberg is doing a lot of reflections on theology and faith and how it helps to improve society. So, Merci beaucoup. We'll Félicitations à tout le monde dans le monde entier, n'est-ce pas? Et tous mes bons voeux pour euh, votre engagement au profit de l'enfance. Félicitations beaucoup. encore une fois, Merci. Euh, Frédéric Seyde. Merci. 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 Mer